Hey, howdy everyone. I'm Michael Perch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin, and I record all of my lectures to support my students with evergreen content and working professionals interested to learn more about data analytics, geostatistics, and machine learning. Now, this is a little bit, this is kind of fun today because I gave a keynote talk just last week at the American Groundwater Trust 2021 Texas Groundwater Conference. And it was such a pleasure to be able to drop by and visit everybody. And there was an opportunity to share my experience around geostatistics subsurface uncertainty, specifically to emphasize opportunities to support groundwater modeling. Okay, so let's go ahead. Uh, there was a request online. People were like, hey, we can go to the conference, but we would be interested in that talk. So I'm going to record it and put it on my YouTube channel. Thank you very much for that request. Appreciation to the American Groundwater Trust, the conference organizing committee, Andrew Stone. Wow, working hard, doing a lot during that conference. Thank you so much, Andrew. Nice to meet you. Cheryl, thank you for all the help. And Steve Young, I suspect you were a big part of me getting this opportunity. So thank you to all. What is my motivation? Why did I jump at the opportunity to give a talk at a groundwater conference? Well, I do believe there is an opportunity to expand awareness and the implementation, the use application of spatial data analytics, geostatistical uncertainty for the purpose of supporting a vital Texas resource, and I would say a resource that's vital no matter what state or country you're in. Groundwater is huge, and I, I respect that, and I'm very excited about that. Now, I have to admit, I also love the water. I often say that the water is part of the, be uh, maybe the best part of the state of Texas. I just love it so much. I People who follow me on Twitter know that I do Almost every week I do a kayaking trip. I have um, eight kayaks in my garage. I invite a lot of friends, neighbors, uh, student groups will go along with me. Uh, people, faculty from the university or visitors from industry will join in. My family grew up. My kids shown here, two of them grew up in kayaks. And so this is <laughs> just a funny story. Um, there were many trips when my kids were young when I'd have a a uh, very young one sitting in the back hatch of my kayak with their life jacket and all the safety stuff, of course. And then two other kids towing behind, um, roped up in succession in their own little kid sitting side kayaks, the Arcadia Scouts, which are really cool. And so I would be paddling, pulling along technically three kids. And so um, I used to love that. That was, to me, a great way to get a little bit of exercise and training. I'll tell you, though, it's very hard to kayak when you've got two kayaks behind you going like this the whole time. <laughs> it makes it very challenging. I'd be paddling. I'd be pulled back. Okay, I should not sit here and tell stories. I should do, maybe sometime I'll do some story time type of videos. But I love the water of Texas. I love Texas. Um, I told them at the conference... I wasn't born here, but I got here as soon as I could. It's a great state. Now, let me refine my motivation, be a little bit more technical, a little bit less um, sentimental or emotional about it. Really, I want to share educational resources, modeling concepts, practical workflows to support professional development. I provide links as I demonstrate methodologies in this talk so that you can actually download code in Python, and in one example, I do it in Excel. I'm actually going to, today, I think I'll write that up in Python for fun. Today's going to be a fun day. Any day you code is a fun day, folks, I'll tell you. Okay, so I share all my University of Texas at Austin lectures and well-documented workflows on GitHub. Anyone who's on this channel knows about this. And so I do it to support my students with evergreen content that outlasts the semester. I think that's important. And I hear from many students. I'm excited to hear that they still use the resources and working professionals. We're up to about 20,000 uh, views per month, which is really exciting. I hear a lot of great feedback. Let me know if you're using the content. It makes me happy. I really want to give back. Okay, okay. so what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce myself. I'll provide a little bit of background, talk about my team and collaboration. You'll see there's method to my madness. It'll kind of set up this. And then we'll talk about 
what is subsurface uncertainty? This is going to be the really fun part of the talk where we get to define uncertainty, become a little bit philosophical about what it means and what do we do with uncertainty and how do we work with it and, and so forth. It is something we can manage. Okay, then we'll go ahead and we'll look at the overall subsurface uncertainty modeling workflow and I'll give a bunch of examples of building blocks, the pieces that you can use in order to get the job done. I'll provide well-documented code examples that'll be demoed. Uh, I don't know if I'll do it live, but the demos are animated and shown in the slides and you can check them out. Okay, so let me go ahead and introduce myself a little bit more. This feels a little bit like caveats, kind of like I'm making excuses for myself, but my undergraduate education is in fact mining engineering. It was the intersection of geosciences and engineering, which to me is just fascinating. My graduate studies included geotechnical engineering. I got pretty close to finishing a master's in it when I turned to the dark side and went to geostatistics with a focus on integrating geologic information sources with co-supervision over in Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Alberta. Shout out to Professor Kat Nunu. Thank you very much for being my um, supervisor on that, along with, of course, my primary supervisor, Clayton Deutsch, um, working in geostats up there. I'm currently an associate professor at the Cockrell School of Engineering in Jackson School of Geosciences at the University of Texas at Austin. My home department is the department, the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering. Shout out to my department. Okay, caveats. Oh, I, I feel like I'm already giving caveats, but I'll carry, I'll carry on. My professional experience and practice has been focused on subsurface characterization, modeling, extraction, planning for oil and gas, mining, resources of the subsurface, 13 years of industry experience, four years working in academia. Now, now that I'm in academia, I do see the opportunity to work in any spatial resource problem. And that does still include energy, mining, groundwater now with some early collaborations, excited to do that. And even I have a student working with the IC Squared group on community development. We, we see all space is space. The subsurface is space. Communities exist in space. <laughs> it's all about space. In my remarks, I will focus on the data-driven subsurface property modeling, that the uncertainty modeling aspects. But at the same time, I, in the back of my head, I'll always recognize that the inter this is a challenging integrated geologic and engineering problem. And so I'm not talking about the physics-based modeling of groundwater or its flow, its phreatic head, and so forth. Um, no, I'm not talking about that, but I recognize that's a big part of this challenge and can be integrated into anything I talk about, of course. I also understand that groundwater faces an additional challenge, and I believe it's analogous to the reserves reporting issue of the energy and mineral area of subsurface. That is that they need to communicate with stakeholders that includes the public and shareholders and so forth. And so the technical approaches have to meet specific standards and be transparent to the public and so forth. I understand all of that complicates things. Let me just make a couple of comments about myself on and off of campus. On campus, this fall will be up to 15 PhD students. New consortium, um, I also have, if you want to hear about the consortium, contact myself or Dr. Foster. Energy Analytics is a freshman research initiative and inventors program in natural sciences, and I am a core faculty of the machine learning lab in computer sciences. Off of campus, I partner with Dr. John Foster and Datum to teach uh, working professionals. And I've taught 1,700 subsurface professionals over 44 events just in 2020 alone. I get kind of tired just thinking about that. So I do a lot of that. This photo is from before the pandemic when everything was in person, but we transitioned to remote and we'll be happy to be in person again shortly. Okay. That was shame. I hope that was not too shameless and self-promoting, but I hope you can see what my background is. You can see my focus on education on and off of campus, and this will kind of motivate and explain what's going on later. What is subsurface uncertainty? I wrote a chapter in a book with Clayton Deutsch a couple of years ago, and um, it, it was really cool. We, we basically just said 
sparse sampling plus heterogeneity equals uncertainty. I think that's a great way to describe it. We know that if you were to have either homogeneity or very dense sampling, you would not have significant uncertainty. It would definitely reduce the uncertainty. What does heterogeneity and sparse sampling mean in the field? Well, credit to Professor Zane Job from Colorado School of Mines. He had this photograph on Twitter looking at the Brushy Canyon Formation, the Guadalupe uh, Mountain National Park. And this is an example of a submarine deep water channel margin. I love this stuff. This is so cool. So within the channel fill, you have these types of massive, they might be called the Boma sequence TAs, type of rock right here, which is massive sandstone. And then you go a short distance and boom, the world changes. Thin bedded mud, um, probably shaly and sandy, um, thin beds mixed in together. Now you can imagine if you sampled over here, you would assume, well, the world looks simple, massive sandstone. You sample over here, you see something totally different. These transitions happen very quickly. Heterogeneity at multiple scales has a huge impact on complicating the subsurface and our ability to make predictions away from a data point. Now, we got if we had homogeneity and it was massive sand everywhere, it wouldn't matter. And if we had dense sampling, we had wells at very tight spacing, we could figure this all out. It wouldn't be so bad. So uncertainty, sparse data plus heterogeneity. Now, what's fascinating is uncertainty is not an intrinsic property of the subsurface. In fact, at every location, location vector u, alpha is a location index within the volume of interest, there is a true feature or property of interest, facies, porosity, permeability, saturation, brittleness, or whatever it might be. There, we, It is available, and it could be measured if we had access. The way I like to tell my students is, if I was to look at a location in the subsurface, and I was to go there, I could, I don't know, teleport myself, or if I could drive a drift and a shaft and, and access that rock, and I pointed to it and I asked the earth, what is the porosity there? The earth would not look at me and say, I don't know, it's uncertain. It could be between 14 and 18% porosity. No, there would be a measure. I could, I could take that piece of rock and I could measure it in a lab and I could get a good measure of the porosity. What does that all mean? It means uncertainty is a function of our ignorance. It's our inability to observe and measure the subsurface with the coverage and scale that we're required to answer our scientific questions and support our decision making. Uncertainty is not an intrinsic property of the rock. It is a function of our ignorance. Now, I promise you that's the rudest thing I'm going to say today. What are the sources of uncertainty? I like to think about three uncertainty sources. Measurement and interpretation error. Every time we measure the rock, here's an example of a core that's been sectioned and photographed from the Bureau of Economic Geology at the University of Texas at Austin. Thank you very much. Here's an example from the Sprayberry Formation. Midland Basin, Texas, when we take measurements from this rock, well, there's all kinds of issues. There's tool tolerance, there's calibration errors. We had to make all kinds of approximations and assumptions when we measure the rock. And of course, when we look at the actual sample you're measuring, well, you extract core from the subsurface. You've gone from in situ conditions to extracting it to above surface conditions, pressure and temperature. You've also got issues with when you extract core, it's, pre it's a pretty violent process. And to what degree does that disrupt the sample? Every data point we have in the subsurface has a thick, irreducible layer of interpretation. Interpreter experience, prior model, uh, the analog choices, and all the other assumptions that go into it are going to have an impact on the precision of the measurement. So we have measurement and interpretation error. What I like to tell my students is because of this, we really do not have any hard data in other words, data that has a high degree of certainty, we really do have soft data. All of our data does have significant uncertainty attached to it. 
Even if you move away from the data locations, you're going to recognize that every time you build a model on the subsurface, there is a whole suite of decisions related to the model. Model parameters, the geologic domains, the property trends, spatial continuity, global distributions. What's the probability we sampled the entire distribution of your property of interest, say porosity? What do I tell my students? You've sampled only one trillionth volumetrically of the subsurface. There's really very little chance that you have complete certain knowledge of the minimum, the maximum, the P10, the P90, the P50, or any other summary statistics of interest from the distribution. There is a lot of necessary inference and model choices that go into any model that we build for the subsurface, and that is a significant source of uncertainty. Even if we knew the property, the feature of interest, at the data locations perfectly, and we knew all of the other modeling decisions, parameters like spatial continuity and segmentation into stationary domains, we must still estimate away from the data. This is spatial uncertainty, i.e. I show multiple realizations from geostatistics, sequential Gaussian simulation. The data points are white circles here, so you can see them on the plot. At this location right here, you can see the realizations vary quite significantly, and that's due to spatial uncertainty. So we capture that with multiple realizations. If we're going to talk about uncertainty, what must recognize that uncertainty is very sensitive to scale. The way I like to pose it to my students is, which would be harder to estimate the porosity or the volume, the size of the room you're in? Look around, look at your room, imagine that room, you're estimating the porosity over that whole room, one number, or to estimate the porosity over a cubic centimeter something you could put in a little teaspoon of, of rock for that room. Which would be harder? Which would have more variability? Look at this example right here. We go from very small scale, well, 100 meters, 200 meters, 500 meters. As we go up in scale, look what happens. The histogram variance shrinks. The amount of dispersion reduces. In other words, the larger the scale, the less the dispersion, Therefore, an easier estimate to make. Okay, if you're interested in how you can solve this problem, well, dispersion variance is a generalized form of variance that integrates scale. Most people don't know that when they use the regular population or sample variance, that that is a specific case of dispersion variance for which you're dealing with data scale within the entire area. Of interest. Well, we can use these types of measures to calculate how the variance should change as we move between scales. Remember, every statistic, every distribution, every model has an implicit scale assumption. Now let's get a little bit more philosophical about uncertainty. What about uncertainty in the uncertainty? Because we've already seen that there is no implicit or objective uncertainty. In fact, Uncertainty is a model. Every time I say uncertainty, I try to remember to put model, uncertainty model, afterwards. So what about uncertainty in the uncertainty model? If it's a model, it has uncertainty. Professor Andre Jornel, emeritus from Stanford Energy Resources Engineering, tells us don't go there. I think that's a, that's a wonderful quote from Professor Jornel. Of course, it, there is uncertainty in the model, but you can see that becomes very circular. You're out further and further on a very thin cantilever. Can we just ignore uncertainty? Because uncertainty is not easy. Why don't we just ignore it? This is the assumption of certainty. It's often a stronger assumption than a reasonable uncertainty model. So we can't just ignore it. We can't bury our heads in the sand. What, what do we do? What we would do is we document, defend, and move on. That's what we do in the subsurface. Let's talk about subsurface uncertainty solutions. Here I present you with the standard geostatistical subsurface uncertainty modeling workflow.
The first step is you take all of the available data, your inferences of the, of the underlying distribution, stationary domains, spatial continuity, all the model parameters. You integrate all that information together and you formulate multiple models, realizations and scenarios, an ensemble of models to represent the subsurface. All of these specific features of interest. You take all of the models. You must take all of the models and apply them to a transfer function. What is a transfer function? It is a calculation applied to a model, a form of summarization that gets you to a decision criteria. What does that mean? Well, an example of a transfer function would be flow rate at a specific location or total pore volume or total water volume. The decision criteria is whatever gets you closest to value, whatever the criteria, sorry to use the word in its own definition, but the criteria used for decision making, it could be flow rates. Now, what I've done is the black boxes are specific geostatistical statistical tools that can be used to augment or to support this workflow. And these are what I'm going to highlight in the rest of my discussion. Let's talk about bootstrap based uncertainty. What is the bootstrap? Well, one of the most powerful statistical developments of the last century. Calculating uncertainty in a model parameter, a statistic, a data set. I tell my students you can bootstrap anything. How does it go? If I have 10 data available to me and I want to calculate the uncertainty in a statistic, that is the average. I will take the 10 data, formulate a CDF. I apply 10 Monte Carlo simulations. What is that? That is random sampling with replacement from the data set, Monte Carlo simulation. The result will be a brand new data set. That's a realization of the data set. Then I calculate the statistic of interest. That's a, the first realization of the statistic, the average. I put it over here. And then what I do is I repeat, I get another realization of the data, another realization of the statistic. I put it right here and I repeat, repeat, repeat L times. If I do it enough times, I will sample and get the distribution of uncertainty in the statistic. Isn't that cool? And that is the bootstrap approach. You can use it to quantify uncertainty due to limited sampling. How does that work? Well, you can imagine if you increase the number from 10 to a million, if I had 1 million data and I did 1 million Monte Carlo simulations, could we all agree the resulting realization of the data would be exactly the same? If you had enough samples with replacement, you eventually get back to the same distribution, the same within some level of precision, statistic, and the uncertainty that you would sample would shrink to very, very low. Okay, how are we going to get started and try this out? Well, I have a very simple example of bootstrap. And you can see it animated right there. It has been developed in a Jupyter notebook and the link is available on that slide to my GitHub repository. The experiment goes like this. You have a hat, preferably a cowboy hat like I use in class. It's got two red balls, six green balls, and you're gonna do a whole bunch of realizations of bootstrap. You're gonna draw eight balls with replacement and you're going to count the proportion of red, the proportion of green, and those are your samples. And then you're going to repeat, repeat, repeat. And when you do that, you're going to build the distribution of uncertainty in the proportion of red balls. Now, the, the, if you want to see the distribution of uncertainty in proportion of red and green balls here, shown as a box and whisker plot, in other words, the mean, the uh, P10, the P90, upper and lower fences shown right here you can see and an outlier shown right there you can see it right there so you can go ahead and you can say well what would happen if i increase the number of red balls what would happen if i increase the number of green balls now you could hold the proportion constant between the two but i hope what i can show you is that as the number of balls increase that the uncertainty in the proportion will decrease. And you can see right here the box and whisker plots are becoming more and more narrow as we go. Excuse the recalculation time is taking a little bit of time. All right, so this is an example of a numerical cowboy hat with a bunch of balls and calculating the uncertainty in the proportion 
using Bootstrap. Now, if you're interested, there is a spatial bootstrap variant, and I do have exercises and examples to demonstrate that. I should also mention here that the example includes the analytical solution for the uncertainty distributions, confidence intervals, and so forth, so that you can compare the bootstrap resamples to the analytical and show that, in fact, it works. You can see that for the proportion. What about Bayesian methods? Bayesian methods are very, very powerful. They allow us to be able to integrate multiple information sources together. The concept of Bayesian goes like this. You build from a prior model, that's before you gathered new information. You then take new information to formulate a likelihood model. And then you update the prior with the likelihood to get to a posture. Now, if you go forward and you get new information, that's your new prior going forward. The evidence term is used to ensure that you have valid probabilities, sum to one constraints and so forth. So this is really a standardization term. The best way to learn about Bayesian updating is to use the Savaya 1996 first edition of the data and analysis, a Bayesian tutorial book. In the first or second chapter, there is this example, the coin problem. The coin problem goes like this. Okay, I'm Professor Perch, I have this coin. I show it to you and I ask you, is this a fair coin? In other words, is the mode of the probability of heads uh, 50%, okay? Now what you have to do is you formulate a prior model. What's the prior model? You look at me and you say, well, Professor Perch, hmm, seems like an honest person. My prior model is likely a fair coin. Or maybe you look at me and say, Professor Perch, never met him before, don't really know him at all. I'm gonna use a naive uniform distribution. That's what's shown right here. In other words, the probability of heads shown right here from zero to one, you say, well, my prior is uniform over that. I have no idea what's going on with that coin. Then what you do is you formulate the likelihood. The likelihood is you toss the coin a bunch of times, you perform an experiment, get new data. And when you do that, you had 743 coin tosses, 20% of them were heads, and this is your distribution right here from the binomial distribution. The probability of the, that outcome given a specific coin bias. Now what you do is you can go ahead and you can update to a posture, which is the probability of the coin bias given the tosses, and this is the result right here. Now you can see, if you had a naive prior, it has no impact, the likelihood will then go straight to the posture. Now let me go ahead and show you this live example right here. I think it's a really nice example. I can zoom in just a little bit. And so I show the example right here where you say, well, my prior is that it's 50% is the coin bias. In other words, it's a fair coin, 50% probability of heads. No, no tomfoolery, no weighting of the coin. And you put a little bit of uncertainty around that. Then you caught, toss the coin 230 times and you observe 50%. Now look at this, this is the prior, this is the likelihood. Notice that the posterior is even narrower. In other words, there's an agreement between the likelihood and the prior and your posterior is even more certain. Now, if you increase the number of coin tosses, you'll see that this distribution narrows. It becomes a higher peak there and less dispersion. And your resulting posture goes even higher. Now, you can start to ask questions like what would happen if the observed proportion of heads is in fact lower than expected in the experiment at 30% shown right here. And now you can see that the posture is updating somewhere between the prior and the likelihood and the uncertainty is going lower. Now I could have a lot of fun showing this, this interactive Python code. It's all available to you in Jupyter Notebooks, which are really easy to use and run. You download Anaconda and boom, you have a nice opportunity for experiential learning. I won't spend any more time on it, but the link is here. You can get it on my GitHub account. What about Monte Carlo simulation? Yet another one of those major developments in statistics last century. A very powerful methodology to propagate uncertainty through a modeling workflow. Now, if the world was simple and your problem was take 
two Gaussian distributions that describe the uncertainty and the thickness of, a, of an aquifer, and now calculate the uncertainty and the total thickness, you could work that out using the back of an envelope and some basic understanding of statistical expectation. You could calculate the mean, the variance, you know it's still gonna be Gaussian. It would be very straightforward. But the world is not that simple. In fact, you have non-parametric distributions or complicated distributions, and you don't just do addition, you have complicated equations. And then you have all kinds of things like thresholding and non-linearities, like it gets very complicated. The way we solve those problems to calculate uncertainty in a result or response is through Monte Carlo simulation. We characterize the uncertainty in all of the inputs. We sample and propagate through the workflow to get uncertainty in the response. Monte Carlo simulation, very powerful tool for calculating uncertainty with its assumptions, and I'm not getting into that right now. I have a very nice workflow at this link right here, Jupyter Notebook, and you can try out changing the distributions, three distributions, and you can add and multiply them together, and you can see that it's not so simple. It's not gonna all be Gaussian and simple to work with. What about geostatistical simulation? I recently did some work where I used geostatistical simulation to integrate information sources, so many information sources and put them all together. These are very, very powerful methodologies. They build spatial property realizations that honor the local data, the global distribution, spatial continuity, trends, covariates, secondary information. They're very, very powerful methodologies. Do you want to get a chance to try some of this out? I recommend you download and work with this interactive sequential Gaussian simulation on a regular grid demonstration. In this demonstration, you can move around the data, you can change the spatial continuity, you can change the random number seed and generate multiple realizations and look at them. You can even change the number of cells if your computer runs a little slow and it'll be able to run faster and faster because of course, when you do sequential Gaussian simulation, you're eventually growing the creating matrices and it can slow down a bit. Subsurface property or feature realization is very powerful to be able to integrate spatial data and model parameter uncertainties. All right, let's just finish up with a comment around decision making. Once you built your decision criteria uncertainty distribution, you can apply optimum decision making in the presence of uncertainty. It turns out that if I have an uncertainty distribution in subsurface properties or in the production rates of a new well or, or something like that, well, you still have to make a discrete decision or estimate. You can't just say, well, we'll drill uh, probability distribution of water wells or will probabilistically drill a well. No, you drill or you don't drill. And so we can use these methodologies which are based on, first of all, what we've discussed, uh, building an uncertainty distribution, calculate a loss function to quantify the cost of underestimation and overestimation shown right here. It's asymmetric in this case. And then we can calculate with this the expected loss as a function of the estimate we make. And from that, we can pick the decision or estimate that minimizes the expected loss. What do I teach my students? I teach them that if you don't impact the decision, you don't add value. Let me just finish up and make a couple of comments. First of all, I hope this was useful and these demonstrations with their links are useful to you. This is an invitation. As a professor at the University of Texas at Austin, I share all of my educational resources. Here's the invitation. Learn new data science skills to augment your subsurface groundwater modeling workflows. I provided recorded lectures in GitHub, um, well-documented workflows to support you. And if you're interested, I also teach short courses through Datum, where I'm a co-founder and the chief science officer. All right, learn new skills for immediate enhanced impact in all you do. Okay, appreciation for this opportunity to give this keynote talk at the Texas Groundwater Conference. I'm happy to discuss and share resources on subsurface data analytics, geostatistics, and machine learning, and I'm easy to find. Here's my email right here. Well, I'm Michael Perch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin, and I share all of my lectures to support my students with evergreen content that outlasts the semester and working professionals, and maybe to encourage people to consider going into STEM and working in engineering and sciences. All right, 
I hope this was helpful to you. Everyone, stay safe.